was so far away I didn't bring it. But it was somebody that had, and I knew it was Brad. Mm -hmm. I said, that's Nona bringing down mm -hmm. Brad on the ski mountain before he could really even walk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Brad was probably 11 months old. Wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, and he was really fast. I said, I said honey, isn't this Nona? Yeah, it had to be because she, mm -hmm. she'd go up and down with him, and he loved it. <laughs> so we lived next door to him, built a house up in the, up in the, Whatever, call it whatever that subdivision is called, up where the powder puff used to be. Yeah, powder yeah. puff area. I can't mm -hmm. think of the name of the trail now. It's down in the nose. But mm -hmm. <coughs> there's Lavelle. Yeah. Lavelle. Yeah. Ain't you known a bell right next red to red wine or soda or beer? Uh, or dogs too. Just figure that. Okay. Thank you. Right, and I couldn't tell you what year it was, whose year right. it was, or anything like that. I can tell when I'm, my, my kids are. Now you had mentioned something to me in a, in a con chat we had online that uh, about your first experience meeting Tony and him taking you, re helping you rehab your, you had had an well, accident. That was a long time after, I mean, but that was after my accident, yeah. Uh -huh. You want me to get into that? Sure. Well, we, well, I was involved in an accident in 1963. I had spent 21 days in a coma, more or less. And uh, my folks were told I likely wouldn't survive. If I did, I wouldn't have many functions left as far as a normal person. And so I, I survived, and I woke up and spent several weeks at home. And finally, it was about time to come up here, and we drove up here. And at that time, I weighed 85 pounds, had black eyes that were out past the end of my nose and could barely talk, my mouth was still wired shut. Mm -hmm. And nobody in town saw most of this. We pulled up and Tony was out sweeping the parking area in front of the theater and my dad pulled up to say hi. And he stuck his head in and said, hi JB, hi Kitty, hi Debbie. Looked at me and said, my God, you look like hell. And I did. And I agreed with him, now you're right, Tony. And he said, well, we will meet we will meet in the morning at the bottom of the chairlift. Well, that's an order to me from Toby. <laughs> and so I did. I showed up whenever he told me to. I couldn't tell you the time. And uh, we began walking up the hill. I might have made it 200 feet. And uh, I was wasting. And he said, well, we'll do this every morning. We was me. I would do it every morning. He wanted me to continue to walk up and go further every day. And by the end of the summer, this is a kid that's if my right leg was paralyzed, I had to drag it, and I had double vision so bad I really couldn't see what I was doing. And just a lot of infirmities that ended up getting fixed through Tony and a lot of work he devoted with me. But at the end of the summer, I could work walk all the way up the mountain and down. And that allowed me to start college at the end of that summer. And that was a good thing and a bad thing. He asked me not to come back to college after <laughs> being there. I was unable to attend classes because I was ill most all that year. Um, but Tony got me my stamina back, a lot of my coordination. And bless his heart, I never told him that like I wanted to. I got to tell your mother that. But I never told him that. Uh, he was an amazing man to me. As a younger kid, he just was an amazing person. And very impressive to me is how he could ski, he could do anything on a pair of skis you wanted to. One of the best memories I have of him is we, he was he was a pacer and a pace setter in a race coming down the expert trail ending in the beginners area. It was spring skiing because it was slushy, and you may remember this. And he came down there and threw his hockey stock. And the air slush went everywhere and it all washed out underneath him. But somehow he got down, unweighted, and jumped over the people in front of him, landed on the deck of the porch, went through the front doors. We went running in to see if it was okay. By then the skis were off and he was trying to down the stairs leaving. He was so embarrassed. I know. But he's just, what he could do with skis was amazing. Did you tell me that he taught you something about skiing, too? No, oh, yeah, every, every time I, he ran across me, he'd tell you something about skiing. And uh, it was always, follow me, keep up with me. And, well, where were you? This is what you did wrong. Let's do it better next time. And 
You know, but then I'd see him three weeks later and he'd check me out. And I got to be pretty decent skewer because of him. Nothing like nothing like Tony. <laughs> or Drew or any of the guys that were good. I took this key exam in Santa Fe one year and, and I, they asked me not to come back there so I never did. <laughs> But that's about it. Tony was just amazing. Elsa was super impressive. Gosh, she'd go in to eat at a restaurant. She'd come back giggling and have that smile on her face. And I don't know. Donna, share a little bit. What do you feel about Elsa? <laughs> well, of course, this was a whole new world. Okay. Uh, I moved to Red River. We did it in October of 1970. It was a whole new world. We brought our son that was nine months old at the time. For me, I'd never been, and I'd always wanted to live in the mountains, but I had never been skiing or anything like that. Well, I guess just a little bit, a couple of years before. Anyway, uh, we were moving up here, and uh, the experience we had meeting the people was just, I loved the people of Red River because so many of them are individuals, and they came up here with purpose, and they were hard workers. And so going to the Alpine was such a treat to go to it and, uh, because of Elsa. She was just a, uh, such a bubbly personality and going in and meeting her in the you know, clothing and everything, you just enjoyed that accent and that laughter and uh, then knowing Tony was a hard worker. I had very little time with him personally uh, just because he was always with the guys and skiing and working and everything. And so with the, I just spent so much time just having babies and raising kids and being up the ski area and running the ski shop and things like that. But uh, all the old timers of, of Red River just left such an impression on me forever and ever. Uh, and uh, just loved it. Watching, <laughs> watching the guys grow up. Uh, from young people and <laughs> everything. It was, it's just, it's it, George and Rudy were growing up and living here and knowing that the work ethic they had from growing up here with their family and, and knowing everybody in town, you have to work a lot. Now I've heard, and we were glad that when they bought the Sitzmark, the windows bought the Sitzmark because it was just a little cabin and it wasn't anything like it is now. And of course we lived in just a little cabin behind that was an old, what had been the old post office at one time, and they said three cabins were put together, and I thought, my goodness. <laughs> it still was only about 900 square feet, but anyway, it was fun with all the, meeting all the people and learning how to to live here, have babies and travel and, and everything to exist during that period of time. How did you, did you have any much interaction with Mr. Uh, Bolton? Uh, no, I didn't have any real interaction with him. He was a nice, nice man. I, whenever I visited with him, he was very cordial. Um, but he was always very busy, busy and focused as well. Uh, Roy Brunson kind of did all his his fix-it work around town. I knew him quite well. And, of course, was very good friends with Johnny and, and Judy Brunson. So, uh, Mr. Bolton had a dream and he did it and he took it as far as he wanted to and decided he would check to it to other people. And that was probably smart of him. We needed to replace that lift when we when we purchased into it and so that's one of the first things we did to get a faster, more reliable lift. And and for a man that engineered it with about the seat of his pants, he did a pretty darn good good job making that lift work. So. Uh, How did, um, did after y'all came, um, did uh, Mr. Bolton have anything to do with the powder puff being with Lester? I don't and, know. Okay. I was, have you ever heard the, any, either the area, either the mountains called Easy Mountain? Mm -hmm. The term Easy Mountain? I can tell you it was interesting and all the snow in town was and it was scraped up from parking lots. Certain winters was reserved for Red River skier or powder puff, and people would go pick it up in their truck, and we'd go scattered out on the trails, and 
you know, God help you if you got the wrong pile in your truck. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was quite interesting. Just take a little break. Thank you. Right around the early days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, you know, that, that, yeah, the early days. No, that I've got been, some water. Well, oh, this yeah. is in 1980. Because that's our daughter, and she was a baby. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah Red River at the end. And um, so that. Now, is that Susan? Uh, I'm not sure. Who okay, I'm sure it looks like her. Susan. Could be. I, I, I just yeah, I, I think it's Susan. And, it's gotta be, yeah. and these are just all. She's saying this is 1980. When I first met. I don't, I'm still not sure if that's her. She looks like Susan. Susan Susan And I'm not sure which all, year all these were. I just took them. Those would be anywhere from uh, um, 1971 through 83. Okay. So those were the years. It's amazing how much is still the same and how much has changed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, always. It really is. It's fascinating. I kept a lot of the personal pictures. Of course, our best friends were um, David and Mary Helen and Johnny and Judy and mm -hmm. all those back then. And, and uh, Krista was born right after we moved here. And uh, okay. um, Brad turned a year old and she was born the next month. And I met Mary Helen in the women's club. Of course, there was Lottie and all yeah. of those there. And it was at the Red Schoolhouse. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I'm trying to remember, I think that's what we did. We even had Is that our Mickey? Christmas. Mickey mm -hmm. Kimbrough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is that Mickey? You had your Christmas what? Well, I think our first Christmas program was there at the Little Red Schoolhouse before we had. And I can remember one time I had uh, was late. I had something going on up in La Harum mm -hmm. and a doctor's appointment. I was late because I was in charge of the Christmas program. Now, we did it at the Red River Ski Area that year. And kids were there, and it was snowing when we finally got to town. And, of course, you know we don't have cell phones that we can call and say, hey, Donna's not going to make it. Don't get bring your kids. And so, anyway, the kids were out there making snow angels and having a good time because we had snow. But that was when, uh, of course, Ellen and Mary were they had teenagers, and they did. Uh, they were doing the. Uh, we did Christmas around the world that year up at the ski area, and they were our narrators, and the little kids were all uh, di different parts. So it was lots of fun. And, uh, that was, I'm trying to remember. Then, this, then after that, we did that up there at the ski area for a couple of years at this Christmas program there, and then we did moved into the uh, community house, and we had all the Christmas programs there for quite a few years, and different people were in charge of pictures when Ra Ralph Gill did it, and uh, the littlest angel was Brian Calhoun. Beth was in charge that year, so I can't remember which years it was, but lots of fun for the and then going ahead and starting our, uh, by the time we were getting more kids in town, that's when we started having our uh, Halloween parties at the community house. Got more and more decorated as years went on. So. What do you insist what, Joni and? Boyle? Boyle. 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 Because I was going to ask you about a family named Ted Boyles. No. Are you no, from Papa? Charlie yeah. and Joni Lewis. Lewis. Hmm. No, I don't remember. Because they, they lived there for years, and he, he lived there because he enjoyed the ski area. Oh, really? Well, yeah. I, I wouldn't know him by sight then, because I was there. No, I, there was one season that I got cross us, so which I, I did that a lot because I'd speak my mind. But, um, I went and worked at Ski Rio for a year, when the year that uh, Paul George and Ron Pockrup had the ski school. Is Paul oh. still alive? I'm sorry? Is Paul George still alive? As, okay. Um, you know, Mr. Bill, I posted something on Facebook a little bit ago about uh, a torchlight parade one time where Paul George would come, uh, skied in the river. Was that correct with that information? Absolutely correct. And, and we all enjoyed Paul George doing it. He, he came out awful wet and, 
Yeah. It sobered up a little bit. There was another person that crashed in that parade up at the top. And you might have seen it in the pictures if you watched that. any kind of video of it. And that was my sister who was skiing on barred skis and the bindings were adjusted very loosely. And I don't know who stayed up there and helped her down after everything went dark. But same torchlight parade. Was that just at the start of the parade she fell? Maybe a third of the way down? About a third of the way down. Okay, I know who that is now. There's a big burn spot with the torches there. Yeah. Now there's another one. That would be Debbie V. Okay. <laughs> then there's another one that I know that were, uh, it was Tom Brown and um, Joel Fontenot. They were on tandem skis and fell. Now, did you ever know why they happened to get out of control like that? What caused that? Couldn't have any idea unless they'd had a little much to drink. They, they, everybody was having a good time in that poor torchlight, as I recall. But wasn't, that was pretty much the, they would go to the Alpine bar and have a few cocktails and then go do torchlight? Well, they pretty well did that every night, but yes, it, it was a, that's what it was, and they'd go to torchlight. I was in that torchlight as well, but I generally was in the front side of it. So, so if I tell you that I was the bartender that night at the Alpine, you would have, you would have acknowledged that probably? Well, no, I didn't hang out at that bar very much. So no. I, 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 probably. It seems like I've heard that story from you. So. Okay. Well, yeah, it, what came of it was they came in the night before the torchlight and had their normal beers and shots of snot, only Elsa and I didn't realize until the next morning that our Snops delivery was a new brand, and instead of being 60%, it was 180. So if you'd had three shots of regular Snops, they had what would equal nine shots and went up there and Paul George skied into the river, and I have verified it here. Yes, you did. Thank you. They uh, get an idea of his memories of uh, Red River Ski Area. Well, let's get started. I, this this is a history Donna and I put together. I've had a terrible memory for years, so there may be some inaccuracies in that, but we're pretty doggone close. In 1955, I first looked, I went skiing in a ski area called Tres Ritas, which is now Sipapu. I don't think Tres Ritas existed at all anymore. It was on a rope tow powered by the rear wheel of a Jeep. And... Uh, Quite icy, but I found I really loved skiing at that, that particular place. In 57, the next time I skied, we went to Santa Fe with another family for, from Pampa, and that's where my dad fell in love with skiing. Uh, I remember sitting down even at that, at that trip and visiting with Kingsbury Pitcher, who was the owner and manager of the, of the area, about skiing. I just loved skiing in the mountain, and I must have skied every trail numerous times, and, and that's really started my love of skiing. In 1957 to 59, we made several trips to Red River, just camping out in the summer, and, and fell in love with that. We always camped up, up uh, by Wheeler Peak Village in a tent and, and just made do up there. Except one time, my dad, right after he bought a new Cadillac, rented a probably a 15-foot travel trailer, and that was for he and my mom to stay in. My sister and I got to tra stay in the tent. When we came over the pass, it was the old pass, and in 1957, 59, that was when Cadillacs had the big fans sticking out the back. Well, every time we made a switchback, those fans cut into the back of the trailer. And you could count the number of switchbacks we went around by the cuts in the trailer. So he pretty well had to buy the trailer when we got back to Pampa. But, but that, that was an interesting story we made. Uh, that's where he fell in love with Red River as far as investing in property, and he invested with T.A. Russell about some property out there. That never was came to fruition. We came up in 1959 and stayed over Christmas at Snapper and Ruth Grinnell's, Old Western. We were awakened one evening, and you said it was Christmas Eve, I think. Right, somewhere there. Yeah, it's right there. Up New Year's Eve somewhere. Yeah. Uh, by the fire at the Monte Vista Lodge. And we got to tend to some of the guests that were displaced. And it was interesting. It was so cold that night 
that when they pumped all their water for their pumper out of the stream, and they put a siphon down there, and before they could get the water to the pumper, it would freeze in the, in the siphon hose. So a lot of the water was just carried up with buckets and everything else to throw. It did burn to the ground. In 1960, my dad decided he'd had a family meeting and, and called us all together, and he wanted to know if we wanted to keep our ski boat or would like to come to Red River and build a cabin and stay in it. Uh, the vote, as I recall, it was two to two. I voted for the boat. So did my sister. And so we bought a house in Red River on Tenderfoot Trail. It's a house built by Harold Maroney. And his house is still there. The Addisons lived in it later. Uh, in 1960, 1962, this whole time frame, by this time I thought I had become a pretty good Texas skier. The skis at that time were about 12 inches longer than my height. Had a great time watching Tony, Siggy, Eric, Gary, and all the others ski. I remember them in ski jackets with their coonskin caps. At this time I began helping a little with Jack Chambliss and the ski patrol, just moving to equipment around the hip mountain place where it needed to be. No pay, but it made me feel important. I remember Tony stopping me several times as I was skiing and offering helpful hints. He would then push off and say, follow me. He'd start off slow, and then after a few turns, he'd disappear. And I would eventually catch up with him, impatiently waiting down there. <coughs> when I finally skied up to him, the comment I received is, I told you to follow me. What happened? From then on, I struggled to keep Tony at least in sight, <laughs> and my skiing began to get much better. He was a fantastic skier. In 1963, I've already told about the, the accident I had and all that, and Tony was responsible for me recovering from that. Uh, the, the man was, I always thought of Tony as a drill sergeant, and if he told me to do something, it was an order. And I did it. Uh, in 1964, a group of businessmen and investors purchased Red River Skier from S.C. E. Bolton. And they formed Mount Wheeler Development Corporation, who actually held the, the paper on it. 1964-65, my parents beat an a, built an A-frame on Vivadale Road by Powder Puff. And 65-67, to 67, we, my dad and I, bought the Money Vista subdivision from Tal Neal or, or one of the Gallagher's. I don't remember which one. That was bought with money that was received in his damages from the auto accident. Uh, the total charges would have blown your socks off of what it really cost for me to stay in intensive care for 21 days and, and all that and have numerous surgeries and, and all that. But the, the settlement was for $30,000. This day and time, who knows how much would have been given, but that's, that was what gave the nut to buy the money this time. 1967, I married that good-looking lady that hangs out with me, and we had our son, Bradley. Uh, we moved to Houston, and began, I began to work at F.H. Maloney Company as a lab tech and a physical chemist. That was work. It paid, it paid my way, but it wasn't a lot of fun. Eventually, through investigating the opportunities in Red River, I moved to Red River into a house on Millette Road, right behind where the Sitzmark is now. Uh, with the intention of working at Molly Corp in a lab after I spoke with Al Grisner. Right after we got to town, the mine shut down, so the job disappeared. I taught skiing that winter. That's when Mitch Hannon was the director and George Hatch was the GM. 71 and 72, the Tom and Donna Beal built a Lindell home on the Viva Dale Trail by a powder truck. I got my broker's license and worked for Fred Rowe, taught skiing and learned all about playing uh, polo from Fred Rowe. Apparently he was a nationally, internationally ranked polo player. Uh, in 73, we bought the inventory to the ski shop at the ski area and operated it that winter and several winters thereafter. In 74, I became the business manager at the ski area. Gary Hanstein was the GM at that point. 73-74, we built a home in Monte Vista in the Upper Valley. Pat Lamb was the contractor on it. 
75, the, it was a transition year in Red River. There was new ownership for the Ponderosa, the Golden Eagle, the Sportsman. So it was new owners coming in, new blood, and, and it was really good for Red River, I feel. Was this the group from Baylor? And yes, Eddie, Eddie yes. Dry. And Eddie Dry, yes. Eddie, Eddie Dry. Yes. Yeah. See, I have a hard time. Eddie Dry is an Aggie. So. <laughs> <laughs> I do too. I'm a Longhorn. Okay. <laughs> yes, it was the summer of 75. In 76, to let you know how, <laughs> how much the Carabell influenced, not the Carabell, the Alpine influenced my dad's thinking on Red River and what he wanted to do with it. The Carabell was to be not just one building but three buildings, four buildings surrounding the five buildings surrounding the lake, and one main lodge across there, which it was going to get to the city, which would have a restaurant, conference center, and all that. Uh, city wasn't really all behind operating that, so that never came, came to fruition. We built the first one. It was the first timeshare property in New Mexico. I and several other people begged him not to do that, and he shouldn't have done it, but he researched it by visiting with the Bass Brothers and, and Snowbird and with some of their properties. And they were very successful with theirs. But ours was, was very successful. We sold all the units out pretty much and all that, but it was a struggle to keep it operating. Uh, we've sold that to a whole, whole new group of people, and they've done a wonderful job with it. 76 was also the year the Red River Academy began meeting in the community house, and that's when I began as the general manager of the ski area. 77, we built a duplex at the A-frames at the claim jumper. And in 80, 81, we built the Woodlands condos and the employee apartments down there. I became the president of the Chamber of Commerce at that point. In 83, we moved to Richardson, Plano, McKinney, and Allen, and worked for, I worked for Casa Bonita Restaurant, which is Taco Bueno was where I was working when I retired in 2016. 2017, we moved to Graham, Texas. And here we are now, back home in our home, uh, having a great week-long visit. Uh, we love Red River. I can tell you that the Alpine, my dad chased every property in town he could find. He couldn't afford any of them. We tried to talk him out of them. Uh, he bought the woodlands and the powder puff, in other words, and, and he, we tried to buy the top of the pass where Johnny Brandenburg had the property and we had a contract on it, and Johnny backed out of that. Actually, we did the subdivision on it. Uh, we did the upper valley. He wanted it to become a little out, a little garmish. We went to garmish and loved it. And he wanted to get rid of this the log slab sided buildings and all that stuff and start cleaning the town up. And probably that wouldn't work for Red River. That wasn't Red River's that wouldn't that wasn't what was appealing to the people that came up here. But that's that's why he was so possessed to try and develop and develop and develop. I left the ski area because I was in ill health from high blood pressure and all that because of debt that had been incurred by the ski area and moved back to the Metroplex to live a normal life. When I left, I had, I had a name on $2 million in short-term in short term paper for the ski area. And we worked through all that in the next year. My dad called me back the next year and said, come back and help me run this. And I said, no, thank you, Dad. We would not be friends if that happened. And he said, okay, I understand, and that's when he sold it to the Jutiki group. Uh, thrilled that, that, that he got it, and thrilled that, with what his family has been able to do with it. Tom, do you have anything you'd like to add to that okay. timeline? I'd love to hear it. Okay, well, what I was going to say is, and Tom left out a whole lot of stuff at the ski area. Um, it was interesting when they started bringing snowmaking in, mm -hmm. and... Uh, I don't know all the particulars. I know that when I ride the ski lift up, and the first red chair he talks about and how they built it and how they had to do it all pretty much by hand and digging and everything going up the mountain. And he will, when we ride the lift up, he, he reminds me of how long it took and how they did it. And it's all very 
fascinating. Uh, when we moved here, like you said, George was the general manager, and uh, um, it was it was a great time. I loved to meet all the people and everything. But bringing in the snowman. What was you your wanted. nickname? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think because it had to do with my skiing. No, George, skiing George gave you the nickname. Uh, Roller Derby Queen. <laughs> <laughs> And that's because I <clears throat> knocked out my three front teeth uh, roller skating. <laughs> and that's right, he did. Uh, we had, it was great meeting all the, and then of course, uh, um, Gary Honstein took over and uh, all of that, but, huh? His nickname was the Hawk. Hawk. He was the Hawk, yes right. he was. He used to hide in the trees and wait for us kids to be doing something we weren't supposed to be doing. <laughs> well, you know, when Tom was a ski instructor up there with Drew and Bob Koss and uh, all the Moods girls, all the Moods girls, and uh, let me see, uh, is he, uh, Ron Pockrent, uh, Al, yeah, PG, Al Cortez. yeah, uh, no, Al, Al wasn't an instructor then. He, oh, he he had already taken the dive off the chairlift, and that was so much fun getting into that element and uh, getting to do that. One year, uh, when they had the Calcutta, and I could ski so little, and, and I was a handicapper, but uh, I'll never forget, and this was when we had the, the award ceremony for the Calcutta over at the Alpine, and I was on a, on a team with, I don't know who else was on it, but I know Ed Hapton was on it, and we won because Donna was a handicapper and she finished the course, so we went on to <laughs> The other handicappers didn't necessarily finish. Yeah, so if you didn't finish the course, you got the slowest time. Yeah. Do you remember who auctioned the people off? No. Thank you. Okay, okay. But that was that was lots of fun. I felt like a, a you know, winning. But anyway, that was a, a great, you know, lots of fun. Uh, I didn't get into skiing very much because uh, I was busy then running the ski shop and and doing a lot of that. But I had the babies and and trying to find babysitters. Oh my goodness, it was hard here. It was just almost impossible. In fact, one of them called. I was at the ski shop, and she called and said, "Chris, Chris was just a little." He was maybe two at the time. And he wouldn't stop crying. I said, well, did you hold him? Well, no, he, he wouldn't tell me what he wanted. So I said, I'll be there. And I don't know who was taking care of him, but he was up on the hill someplace. And I ran and got him. And I brought him back to the shop. And um, Oki Velasquez, she was working in the ski shop. She said, you're not taking him back to them. He's staying here. So Chris literally grew up in the ski area. Bertha was one of the cook upstairs. When I couldn't find the kid, he would be upstairs helping her out, or he'd be back in the ski ski, rent, yeah, ski rentals and everything working back there. I'm just being, they were watching over him. So he literally grew up in, this, in the ski shop. So did uh, Brad, when he, when he was uh, went into REI and the sporting goods business, and they said, well, where'd you get your retail experience? He said, I had a price gun in my hand when I was about two years old. Because, <laughs> you know, we just, that's the way you do it. You just grew up around it. So that was fun. But I'm not sure exactly when the first snowmaking, going back to that, came in. It was about 73, 74, about. Mr. Bolton had some on the bump. Yeah. Did he? Yeah. He did? 61. Okay. Yeah, 61. Okay, good. I had some old diesel generators that made the snow great. Water part, and they had little, little bitty guns on little tripods. Yeah, they weren't very efficient, were they? <laughs> like squirting water out of the hose. There's some film of that in their original movies. Just little one inch nozzles. Spraying. I think they really upgraded it in 74, 75 when they put the new red chair in. And that was it. And it, was, it was concurrent with yeah. that. Yeah. And, and that was a, a much bigger project than anybody would have thought. We put an eight inch steel pipeline to the top would carry high pressure water and then an aluminum eight inch pipeline to the top, stopped it midway with the water line and then took it all the way up. We had a booster pump up there at midway point 
We'd actually have 600 PSI water at the bottom and then boost it up again to hit it all up to the top. And the air would go all the way up at about 100 PSI. And, and so we were able to mix, mix and all that. The guns were still not real efficient. That was, that was nothing like they got now. We were squirting the water that was a little finer mist than we were doing with SEB's product, but it allowed us to open in years when we likely couldn't have, and at times that we likely couldn't have. Uh, it was an expensive investment, but extremely worth it, and we were, had the largest snowmaking system in the southern Rockies at least, if not all the Rockies for a while. Shortly thereafter, all the big ski areas in Colorado started to put in major systems, and, and they relied on it to build ski race trails and all that very nicely. Uh, but it was fun learning that process. It's kind of fun because we'd moved up in the Upper Valley shortly thereafter, and uh, the power would go out in the Upper Valley, and you don't know if the power is off in town at that point. I'd call Drew, and Drew might have been hanging out there with you, I don't know. Uh, and the phone would ring and ring and ring, and finally I'd, I'd just have to drive the town to be able to get any sleep to make sure the power was on or off. And uh, so that happened numerous times. Uh, but he, it, it he would also call in. To, I mean, if it was snowing up there, he'd have to come to town and check if it was snowing here or on the well, sure. <laughs> Didn't get a lot of sleep in the winter time. Nobody did there. <laughs> but it, it was fun. It was fun living in the Upper Valley. Uh, if we were out of electricity, Towski Valley was. And uh, we were on their feed line. What was the uh, relationship between Gary Starbuck and John Miller before they went to Powder Puff? Were you involved? Were they worked at the, re at the ski area, didn't they? Yes. As far as, and John, John was in management. Gary, I think, was an instructor. I don't know their personal relationship at all. They just got they together as partners to do powder yeah. puff? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then years later you purchased that area mm -hmm. and turned right. it to Woodlands. Mm -hmm. right. And what ended that? Was there a fire at Woodlands? Is that? No. Did, oh, I had heard that there had been a fire at the baseline. Are you talking about a powder puff? Uh -huh. Fire at Powder yeah. Puff? Uh -huh. No, I'm not aware of one. Mm -hmm. I don't remember hearing okay, stories I, of that from The base lodge at the main the ski area, our ski area, burned. Yeah. Early, yes. Earlier on yeah. in the, yeah, yeah. I have to get this. And that was fun. It destroyed all our records, and we had to go back and recreate all the records. What year was that fire? I don't know. I'm sorry, I was a young man, and I didn't care. Oh, yeah. What <laughs> about, <laughs> there was a mysterious break in there one time. Uh, Tell me the story. At, at a time, I think it's about 1975 or 76, it seemed like the safe was broken into in the office. Yeah. And everybody in my group of people, we were blaming each other for doing it. I was wondering what the outcome was. I never heard. Mm -hmm. Tell me the story of that. If you uh, <laughs> well, I arrived at the office. I, you got there very early as a rule to open up. I was in charge of playing money. Open up the back office, and it was like a snowstorm that hit back there. And yeah, it, it, they had taken our cutting torch out of the garage, pulled it down, and cut the back door open, and, and wheeled it in, and cut the safe open. Do we know who did it? Quite probably we do. We never could prove it. We know people were spending burned money in certain places, like an angel fire. Uh, things like that. Uh, oddly enough, there was a safe was a safe in town exactly like ours, and oddly enough, our safe was cut in exactly the places the bolts were in, in this, that safe. So there was no cut anyplace else. Uh, so you know, did we know who did it? Not for sure, but we probably have a decent idea. And uh, you know, sometime later, one of the guys who probably was involved in it was caught breaking into a similar safe in, uh, where was that? Where did, where did Brunson come from? Claude. Claude, Texas. Hmm. Trying to piece this all together. 
<laughs> so I'm we not giving you any names. I mean, that's not right. Well, I got a few names, I think. <laughs> you probably do have a few names. Yeah. The, I, I, see, I had just finished, we had just replaced the ball mills at the mine, and have, we got like six months of 12-hour day checks, and mm -hmm. I just bought a new car, and everybody was like, oh, you're the one. <laughs> <laughs> right. So far as I know, you were never a suspect. So. <laughs> well, we were but, but it was a, it was a pain, and, and I'll tell you what, that was a very positive move for us. We upped our insurance at that point. We only covered for seventy-five grand. The total loss was about thirty thousand. More money probably burned up than they made off, off with. Oh, it burned in the I see. Well, I didn't know that yeah. part of it. And, and fortunately, the credit cards and all that were still good, and the checks were in a different place, so we were secure and able to do that. That's the part of the deposit. But it's a shame, and now I understand we got a crime wave going in the area again. That's that's really a crime shame. Mm -hmm. uh, it it set us back on our heels. I can tell you that it was thirty grand that was real money back then. Mm -hmm. But what it did for Red River is is we gathered up the next big weekend, which I don't know what that would have been. It was a, what is a three day weekend? Uh, we saved all our deposits up and. Uh, went into the First State Bank in Taos with all that money. You know, and we probably had around $70,000 in cash and, and uh, you know, all the other deposits that went with it. And it was my dad and I that took them in. And we had asked him to put a safety deposit box in the bank up there, not depository. No, we can't do that. And we went down there and they had two windows open. My dad took one, I took the other. and it, we were there when they opened the door and walked out about noon. And they had informed us when we walked out we'd get our night depository. And that's when that went in. Uh, and that was nice. Now, from then on, unbeknownst to everybody, I carried a pistol every time I went to the bank. And he also had the police escort. escort. Police escort every evening. Sometimes he didn't know it was a police escort. Yeah. Uh, but. We learned a lot from it. We had some interesting affairs where when the power would go out at the ski area, of course our customers got very mad, very irate. Anybody that's been in the ski business knows that. Uh, we, we would do our best to write credits as fast as we could so at least people had a piece of paper to come back and ski and get at least full credit, but usually more credit than they'd lost. One day we had a man that walked in and, and he was just mad as could be. I couldn't get him calmed down at all. And he goes up to the rental desk and grabs the cash register and walks out the door with it. <laughs> had the radio on and the cops were there and met him as he went out and busted him. And we had the register back before he left the building. Uh, another interesting story, we had the page you go trout lake down the way and we had a, a gentleman show up with two, two nice boys, very nice boys. I think he was driving a Mercedes and he set these young kids out, probably 10 or 11 years old, and it was World Series time. And he said, I'm going to go watch the World Series in the, in the bar, and I'll be back to get them, let them catch however many fish they can. I said, sir, you don't want to do that. And uh, so I argued with him for a few minutes. No, that's what I want to do. You just, I've got to get to the game. And he disappeared to the bar. We had four buckets <laughs> of trout when he got back. And, and they were char we were charging 10 cents an inch for him. His bill was $110. And the question I had for him, sir, do you want me to clean these fish or not? No, you can have those fish. <laughs> I'm not paying for them. Got in the car. I clicked my radio. The cops busted him before he turned on Main Street and, and took him to jail and booked him in front of his kids. And <laughs> he made good on the check. He made good. We had, we had a guy one time that bounced a check with us, and you don't need to put all these in, in your report, but he bounced a check for us, from, he was from Dallas Fort Worth Ski Club, for uh, oh, about $3,000, I think. And I, I don't like that when people do that. And so I called a policeman I knew in Dallas and said, for every penny you get back, you can have half of it. He got back all $3,000, it took him about a year and a half to do it. Mm -hmm. But he'd go up about three in the morning and beat on the guy's door. 
and he explained he was going to break his arm if he didn't get some money. And, you know, that's how he did it until he finally got it all paid off. And I got $1,500 out of it. And he did too. All right. Let me ask you, as <clears throat> residents back in Texas and originally Texans, what do people, um, what's their reaction when you meet somebody and they find out that you used to be a, a Red River a local? Or that you lived up here and experienced life up here. They, Why they did all, you leave? Say that again. Why did you leave? Is a good question. And and the reason we would give wasn't a good one for him. I mean, mm -hmm. it was to escape the pressure it was under. I whipped out, if you will. I should have fought it a little more, maybe. But it was good for me, I think, wasn't it? I think. Well, it, it was, was bad on the family. In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. I think because Brad was 14, Chris was 10, and Melissa was 4. And at that time, you didn't have, we didn't have the uh, charter school here. We tried the private school, uh, and it had been kind of a disaster. It's not easy getting an education up here. Um, in, you know, in Cuesta or Taos, you make decisions whether they go over to Cimarron or Cuesta or Taos. Uh, and I know some have gone down to um, Roswell, to the institute, uh, what is it called down there? NIMI. The military yeah, the military. Nimi. That's where Deke went. We went to his graduation, and I was looking, that's where we were probably going to send Brad. But Chris was another, you know, he was athletic and everything. But I was really afraid to put, you know, and Melissa, she was just a sweet little girl at the time, and figuring out where she needed to go. So I think for them and their education, we probably would have done better if we hadn't gone through such a big school system in Plano, but uh, it, it's, uh, th they did very well to do that. Uh, but um, Tom and I, I'm, I'm missed. I, I was not nice to him or my father-in-law for lots of years because I <laughs> miss Fred Rivers so much. Well, I missed you too. And, but uh, it was... Uh, it was probably good in that way. But what people do when they find out, and they're going to find out, if they, if they don't have to know us very long before they know about Red River mm -hmm. and our time. I mean... This was our home. We, yeah. we raised our family here. They, all of our kids, all but one, were born up in the heart. So. When I was working, I did lots of retail work when I was in the city, and I had a dress shop. People would know. When, I mean, just conversation. Well, where are you from? What did, did it, how did you get here? Well, I lived in Red River. Have you ever been? And there's lots of people in the Metroplex that have been. And absolute, I have never heard somebody that's been here that didn't fall in love with Red River. In fact, when we come up here, we have to be quite, quite no, can I put me in your suitcase? Can you, you know? Mm -hmm. So it is, uh, some of them just like the summer, and some of them ski, uh, but it is. it has just a great, uh, reputation because, you know, and there's lots of people that go on to Rio Dosa because that's a little bit closer and especially Lubbock area, but if they have ever gone up here and there, they really prefer Red River, just the mountains, and I said, this is such a town that you can bring your kids, and after they get a little older, they can just go out and just, the streets, it sounds bad, but they can go mm -hmm. out and up and down. You don't have to worry about them as much as you do in other places, so... Let me tell you a story about another one of my favorite ski people that, that to me is kind of an equal with, with Tony. Not near the skier that Tony was. A guy named Bill Burgess, mm -hmm. who we just lost. Great friend of mine, for sure. Enjoyed him, joy, <laughs> excuse me. I enjoyed him to death. And, uh, and one night we were coming back from Santa Fe, and I wasn't driving. One of the few times I'd let Davis Willis drive my car because I had a terrible earache. And he was on antihistamines. We were coming <laughs> back, and it, was, it had been snowing, and the ice was just all over the highway. And we got about, I don't know, about a turn before you went down to the big turn going into Taos. And there was a gravel, not a gravel truck, a sand truck turned over down there. And so the traffic was backed up all the way up. And you could step out of the, out of our car and ski down the 
road. Well, shortly somebody came skiing down the road just on their shoes. It was Bill Burgess with two bottles of wine. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all want a drink? Well, yeah, Bill. So Bill stopped, and we had a lovely time. Bill I can see it. And he yeah. skied on down the way. That's Bill Burgess. I mean, yeah. oh. <laughs> that, that was a lot of fun. Uh, it, it, the ski business is a special business. And it, it really, as you meet people, you, you learn to love them and trust them. Donna can tell you about going to Crested Butte for an exam clinic when I went up there, and uh, she fell in love with that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But just hanging out with the women was fun. So she, she went and hung out with all the, all the wives. Nat, Nat Pochran and Shirley Koss, the three of us really had a good time on the mountain up there. So, But we didn't get a chance to do it down back here because we all had to work. <laughs> and, you know, you just didn't get a chance to get out. So we really had a good time. I loved all the people. I still do. They're still considered my best friends, if you will, over the years. So. I don't know how. Uh, when uh, you see in the media, and say in the Dallas Fort Worth area, when they mention Red River, or is it a special? Do they give a. Do the people. You know, we don't see it much in the. Like and the major broadcast TV at all mentioned of any of the ski areas, to be honest with you. Remember, y'all used to have all those billboards down in Waco and Amarillo, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. if it didn't snow last night, we made it. That right. got us covered every weekend. What's that? that? We got coverage from those every weekend. Oh. And we also had trips bringing people up every weekend, all the different Buses. TV stations, remember that? Mm -hmm. And we'd put them up someplace, we'd feed them, we'd do all that. And then they'd go feel indebted, and they'd, they'd tout us on their TV and radio station. That works, and advertising is what keeps a town like Red River alive, believe me. And, and, you know, George can do the best job he can with his shop. It all make it the most significant thing in the world. If he doesn't have somebody with dollars in his billfold, it doesn't do any good. Uh, it, and if you have a bad ski, situation, conditions, and all that, I'm going to affect him, you know, I, my, my worst nights were, were worrying, can I get this ski area open, if I don't, what's going to happen to these people, and uh, I don't know that my dad had those feelings, but I did, I just worried myself to death with it. Uh, let me, let me just kind of jump in here, um, when Tom was talking about the advertising, and Tom was part of the chamber during the, anyway, I'm just going to talk about the period of the 70s because that's when we were here. And he and Drew worked so hard getting the name out there and the, having the groups come in. And like you said, well, there was one time I know that it was on a Sunday morning. And I looked up at the ski area. I'd taken my kids to church, and I looked up there, and there was 13 church buses. And I said, if God comes back, he's got to come to Red River Ski Mountain because that's where everybody is. <laughs> and I just, it just was, but that was work that was done primarily by Tom and Drew during that period of time. And to get people, they worked the, you know, they go back and work all the uh, areas that they could in the city and go to and one of our most fun things we put together was a, a, a ski class at Evelyn Christian University. Yeah. College at the time, I think, but university now. Uh, where they taught the PE class was conditioning, you know, building your body up so you could ski. And they taught some basic as far as weight transfer and all that, just the, the principles of skiing. And then they came up here and spent a full week here and, and skied. Teddy Varner was the professor that put it together. He ended up buying one of the con one of the duplexes we built. Uh, he doesn't own it anymore. But it was a wonderful thing. That went on for, I don't know, six or seven years. They still come up. They still. Do they? Do they right. still come up? Every year. That's good. wonderful. I am, that thrills me. Yeah, good. I taught the groups uh, in 2004 and 2005. That were Abilene Christian. Okay. They actually came to Kachera one year 
and had a bad experience, and then they started coming back. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, we, we really loved being able to do that type of thing. It really made us feel good. The other thing we tried doing, and it, it failed miserably, was we we went around and solicited from the lodges to to help out with uh, kids ski free, kids stay free type presentation. And then we promoted it in CADM, the Consolidated Air Tour Manual. And Southwest agreed to put it in their magazine. And we ran that. And the problem we had is that some of the lodges wouldn't honor the, wouldn't honor the uh, commission, if you will, that they wanted to sell the package. And so they, they failed miserably. But it got the idea of kids ski free, stay free, kind of stuck with a lot of people. And that, that worked out well. Did y'all ever distribute a uh, gold season pass, or was that just a item that was sold in ski shops? It's very authentic looking. It's by the has the imprint from the what's the Russell Ticket Company or whatever. It wasn't us. Was it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Not not what we had on. Uh -huh. here. <clears throat> but you know, when I left here, left ticket was thirteen dollars. What is it now? Mm. Now I know why it is. Yeah, I know why it is that and all the lifts and all that. Any questions? Uh, well, just to let you know, Southwest employees still get discounts. Great. Good. Good. And ski free, stay free, still go on Star Wars. Good. That's that's a blessing to hear. We we started a lot of programs with a cup couple that the chamber heard. While I was on the chamber, I wasn't, wasn't president at that time, Dick and Nikki Scrundall, and they started programs like the Motorcycle Rally, uh, the Chili Cook-Off, just all kinds of things they tried to fill in weekends with. That it was tough sell for sometimes with the business people, the retailers that weren't in the know about how to really promote their, and some of them my best friends. No, that's, that's going to kill me if you do that. They'll all go someplace else. They won't come buy stuff uh, from me. Well, no, it, it brought people to town like mad. And so everybody ended up benefiting, maybe not as much as they would if they could have trapped them all in their store, but you can't do that. Uh, we couldn't do it at the ski area. We had a competitive ski area. I mean, they could go to Angel Fire, they could go to Taos, they could go to Powder Pug. Uh, and we didn't try to compete with those others. I mean, we tried to work together with all of them. Enchanted Circle. And at one time we had a discount ticket we all sold, and that died for some reason. I couldn't tell you why. It, you could travel, you could buy a ticket in Red River and travel to all three. Is it still going? Is uh, it? People, is would it? Use, people would use that. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. That's still mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think they would. The problem is the disparity in cost for Taos and Red River and Angel Fire yeah. probably average that out. Just while you're mentioning that, I found one time, I was riding the shuttle at Angel Fire one time, <clears throat> and the two ladies from the same town were seeing each other and didn't know they were up here. And one lady said, yes, we're seeing, we did tiles yesterday and Red River the day before, and we're here today, and then we're going to go over to Powder Puff and then head on back. You know, uh, Powder Puff was part of people's. A lot of people right. didn't realize that people spent the day there. The kids could. Sure. Right. We realized it. Well, I know you did, but uh, I was, historically speaking, a lot right. of people just see it as a, a residential area now and not a place mm -hmm. like that. Does anybody else have any questions or comments? So back in the early 70s, do you have any stories about George and India Hatch? You must have some stories. Well, about certainly. When we moved here, oh my when we moved here the night we got here, <laughs> we were moving into the house that was behind the sitzmark. It was red tagged when we got here, and there were no windows in it. There was no nothing. And and so, my folks had their house they built up on, on up in the middle road up there, and uh, we could stay in it if we could just get into it. And with George had the key. Mm -hmm. But George was picking up straw up in Monte Vista or someplace like that. And he'd taken one of the six by sixes up to do that. 
and George was driving back and he either threw one of his cigars out or a spark came out of off the exhaust. Do you remember that? No, I think I heard a little He burned the six by six to the ground. Yeah. <laughs> I have big memories of that. And, and, he burned uh, something off. Well. India was trying to But George was always doing something like that. <laughs> Wasn't he a beautiful skier though? Uh, he was, he yes. was fun, yeah. He was a strong skier, I can tell you that. He, he would take off through the through the jungle and beat his way through the trees. I don't know how he kept from killing himself. Uh, but he, he was a hoot. They named Donna the, the uh, roller derby queen. Uh, he lived at uh, Fifth House and there was three, what, three apartments, four apartments there? Yes. And they had like a tunnel through the closets where they could all interconnect with each other. Oh, yeah. Party. Yeah. Yeah, he told a story himself about when he was at, at uh, Sandia. They had a contest on who could fell a tree the closest to a particular spot. And George says, well, I'll stand there. You just see if you can fell a tree there. George stood there and he caught a tree, just a glancing blow off his head, knocked him silly. And uh, he recovered from that. He destroyed a couple of backhoes, I know. The funniest story that I remember is we bought him a brand new pickup from Hatch, New Mexico, bright red. And we were digging some of the snowmaking trench to put pipeline up over to the chairlift down one of the access roads. We had a great big boulder of blue granite that we just couldn't get through, so George went and got some dynamite and puts it under the... And if you haven't ever handed, handled explosives, you, you can't be blamed, but he, he put this dynamite under the boulder and all that. And George hadn't rolled down his windows on his truck, and it was parked 50 feet from where the hole was. And the concussion from the explosion blew the windshield out onto his hood, <laughs> one piece. But, uh, you know, just things like that he'd do, which was a uh, hoot. You know, uh, when he was at Rio, he uh, yep, he'd start that, that broom in the morning and ran up on him, and he was trapped mm -hmm. under it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. He was the general manager of the year, I was there. He was quite a nice man. He, he was neat. Uh, the reason he ended up loving us, I, I probably got on his case too much. He was going to Angel Fire or someplace and buying one boat and charging me mileage and all that. And I said, George, let's put a let's put a warehouse back here with all the tools and nut, and all the bolts and all the nuts you're going to need. Now, you can't do that. I said, well, sure I can. It'll save us money in the long run. So we did it, and that cut down on a lot of, a lot of a lot of his travel to different places, and uh, I don't know, I'm not saying that, uh, <laughs> but he was fun, and we enjoyed him, and they've all been fun. Hans Stein was fun, the Hulk was a blast. Uh, In the, I don't know which winter it was, when the, that Thanksgiving we got snowed in, we got all that snow. It was 72. Was it 72? 52 mm -hmm. inches. No, it's 72. We got the snow on November uh, 5th is when y'all opened that year. Okay. Yeah, but no, there was a Thanksgiving we got a bunch of snow, and it was after Chris was born, so it was more like 74. Okay. We got so much the snow. It was early, but it was like about Thanksgiving time. Our town was completely shut down because all the snow removal equipment was still south or something. They hadn't brought it up north. Or it was an excuse. They couldn't push that much snow. They had to and they couldn't push, and, yeah, and they couldn't push that much snow. And, and I think a lady had a heart attack or something <laughs> trying to get her out of town. I mean, it was just... Yeah. But we were up the valley by then, we were, so it had to be 74, 75. Well, is that the year they stayed up, open until April? Late April? Probably. Could be, yeah. Yeah, that was my first year here, was 72, 73. Was well, 72, se that year, yeah, 73, you're right. Because we were, uh, that was when we, <laughs> we had our honeymoon that year. Uh, we'd been married five years and we'd never had a honeymoon, so Tom and I took off in uh, October and we went to Tahoe and then we went on into San Francisco. When we were coming back, we hit Tahoe and there was snow coming down. We chased the front. We were going to go back through the middle of Colorado or something, and we had to come south because you had to have chains going through Colorado. We chased that front all the way back, and it dropped snow. And so that would have been, what did you say, it? November 5th? 
Yeah, that makes sense for that's when we were coming back. I mean, and then from then on, it was the best snow year we mm -hmm. had been since we'd been here. Yeah. That was my first year here, and it did that snow on Halloween. And then they yeah. opened on the 5th. Yeah. And we had just remodeled uh, yeah, right. Max Bar to the Doggone Saloon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, I thought, man, this is going to be neat. Now. <laughs> Ski every day from the 1st of November till April 23rd. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think we've got a really uh, nice evening on tape here, and I appreciate y'all so. Uh, the effort that it took for you to bring the material that you did, and uh, look forward to seeing y'all again. Sounds great. Some time here in good old Red River. Absolutely, absolutely. We'll likely be back November the fourth. Mm -hmm. That's that's the celebration of the fortieth anniversary of Faith Mountain. Well, yeah, when the, the original. There's the sixtieth anniversary. Do you know anything about? What the ski area is going to do? Anything special? Okay. Hopefully we'll see it's a, this, the <laughs> ski area celebration. Oh my thing. goodness. I did talk to uh, Jean uh, Bolton, uh, Stokes' daughter-in-law, uh -huh. and uh, she said that uh, they hadn't heard much from Red River over the years, and I sent her a, a DVD of the original movies and some film that I had taken around mm -hmm. and expressed to everybody's uh, <coughs> appreciation to her family. Mm -hmm. 